All right, let's talk about our next plant list. This one will be plant list 4A, and this is the final 20 that we will cover, 4A and 4B. And so we're kind of getting to some miscellaneous categories, and I like to focus on what is in flower at the moment. And I'm also looking at all the plants that we could cover and what are the ones that are very important for you to see and recognize in our world. So th these next two lists will be a little bit uh, miscellaneous. Uh, this one is gonna be mostly shrubs and then the next list will be mostly trees. Although there will be a few outliers thrown in there. At this point in the year, we're right in peak spring where we have lots of things blooming and year upon year, uh, we may have that bloom time take place earlier or later based on the, the weather. So is it a dry year or is it a rainy year? And what are the temperatures like? And we can have some of these plants blooming in slightly different times, but it's always like a one month window. You're either two weeks ahead, two weeks behind or right in the middle. And so the things we see now are the tail end of the peak blooming season for San Diego. Now, when we talk about blooming in San Diego, there's our native plants, our Mediterranean plants that in this part of the world primarily bloom uh, mid to late spring. But we have other plants we've introduced that will bloom all through the summer. And some of those are some of the typical landscape plants that we see in gardens around San Diego. But those need water to grow through the summer. And so what we're going to talk about today are, are a little bit of both, the Mediterranean transitioning into some of the more temperate or subtropical even plants that will bloom through the summertime. So here we go with plant list 4A, and I'm simply calling it shrubs, even though there are some outliers in the mix. The first plant on our list is Aca Salowiana, the pineapple guava. This uh, scientific name changed somewhat recently, and so some people still refer to it by the older classification, which is Feijoa. Uh, this plant comes from South America, Brazil, Argentina, and so uh, Feijoa has that Portuguese-sounding name. Uh, but uh, several years ago now, the, the classification officially changed to the genus Aca. It's in the Myrtaceae, the myrtle family, which is similar to several other types of trees that we have here, including eucalyptus. But this one is a small tree. It can be pruned to have a single trunk or it can uh, have a multi-trunk form, very tolerant of pruning, and it produces a fruit that is edible. So this is a fruit tree and not really one you see in grocery stores too often because the fruit has a very short shelf life and you would need to eat it very soon after harvesting. So we miss out on a whole bunch of different foods that are perfectly fine to eat, but they don't last very long in the grocery store. So they're not really part of the common or typical diet. And the pineapple guava is one of them. Now, this is not in the same genus as the other guava species. And it's given the name pineapple guava because of its uh, flavor. People say it tastes like a pineapple mixed with a strawberry or a guava. And I always find that difficult in my descriptions when people ask, what does it taste like? And then I try to com combine two other fruit tastes. In my mind, this just tastes like a pineapple guava doesn't really taste like any other kind of fruit, but I can somewhat see a resemblance between, I guess, a pineapple, sort of a tropical fruit flavor. It's uh, absolutely delicious. I think it tastes better personally than a lot of the other true guavas that you can find out there. And it's easy to eat raw. You can eat the flesh, you can eat the skin. Some people peel the skin. Some people then turn the flesh into preserves, jellies, jams, frozen, things like that. 
It also has a very beautiful ornamental attractive flower, which you can see on the left hand side. The flower is also edible. You can eat the petals, you can eat all parts of that flower, which is kind of fun. And it has a little bit of a sugary flavor, kind of like a cotton candy flavor. You may want to uh, add that to fruit salad, drinks, smoothies in the summertime, or uh, even potentially to like a leafy green salad just to uh, brighten things up. But I always uh, caution people, don't eat too much flowers, otherwise you won't get enough fruit. So it's fun to eat the flowers, but it's even more delicious to eat the fruit in my opinion. So I appreciate the flowers when they're there and watch as they get pollinated and make way to this delicious pineapple guava fruit. As far as fruit trees grow, this one is a low water use plant. So it's much more drought tolerant than many of the other kinds of fruit trees that you could plant in San Diego. And so this tree, this small tree is right at home with a lot of our other Mediterranean or climate appropriate plants, which makes it especially valuable because it gives you some food as well, low water use. Being a small tree or a large shrub, uh, this one is really good as a screen, a hedge, and it tolerates pruning so well. So you could actually have several of these growing in a line and you can cut them to whatever shape they need to be. You can keep them small. Although if you allow them to grow to their full size, they can get to about eight to 10 feet across and uh, 10 to 12 feet tall. Uh, because they don't get much taller than that, that makes them good candidates for growing underneath power lines. So if you've got utilities around and you don't want to have anything that grows up too tall, uh, this would be a good selection for a yard that has power lines overhead or even close to houses with eaves, awnings, other things where you may not want to have a tall tree getting in the way. The flowers obviously are attracting to birds and other pollinators and it provides ornamental as well as uh, a food source in the landscape. It's a very versatile plant. It's one that is well at home in a San Diego garden. As far as fruit trees go, this is an evergreen. So a lot of our fruit trees are deciduous. They will drop their leaves. This one stays evergreen. You can expect leaves on year round. The leaves themselves are a bit interesting. They've got a darker top and a, a light color on the bottom. And so that two-tone color, sort of a silvery along with a darker green, gives some nice variety in the landscape. And the wood, once the tree gets large enough to have wood that's displayed, as well, the wood has sort of an ornamental characteristic. So there we go with our first plant. This is pineapple guava, Aca seloiana. And next up, we have Budlia davidii, the butterfly bush. We've talked about uh, milkweed as an important plant for butterflies. And here is a non-native plant that is also good for butterflies. Notice the small cluster of flowers. That's a characteristic that indicates uh, butterflies may be attracted to this plant. Butterflies of all types, including monarchs. This plant, butterfly bush, has uh, been in cultivation for a very long time as an ornamental plant. It's very common in traditional landscapes. And by that, I mean kind of the British English uh, temperate climate landscape. It's a bit out of climate here in San Diego. It takes a little bit more water, but uh, it can find a niche, a space where it grows just fine. In other parts of North America, this can be a little bit invasive, uh, including in parts of California where it gets a bit more rain. So you would wanna have some caution with where you plant it. But here in San Diego, that doesn't seem to be much of a problem and tucked away in a garden, it grows just fine. As the name suggests, it attracts butterflies. It will also attract hummingbirds to the colorful and fragrant foliage. Uh, it's a valuable nectar source for wildlife in the garden. Because this one has been in cultivation for so long, it has a few interesting characteristics that are attached to it. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of different cultivated varieties, named varieties you can get that have a slightly different color, 
uh, flowers, as well as some different growth habits. Also, it has uh, alternate spelling. So whether you spell it with an I or with a J uh, varies based on the source. Commonly, it is spelled with a J, B-U-D-D-L-E-J-A. There's really no one standard. You could spell it either way and be correct. The problem here is that at the time of publication of classifying this plant taxonomically, uh, it was so long ago that it was before computers, you know, so instead of just selecting a font on your computer, these were published using the printing press and typesetting. And there was a time when it was kind of a cool style to alternate certain letters, to embellish certain letters. And instead of the I, lowercase I, they would do the lowercase J because it looked a little bit more cool. It was a little bit more fancy. And uh, some similarities with like S's and F's and things like that. And so you would try to look at the spelling and if you read it correctly, it would have the J there. Uh, but really, if you looked at what the intention was, it was to use the I. And so now it's been so long since that's happened that if you look at these classic texts that are like the authority on how to properly spell these names, if they came from that time period and that location where it was common to use the fancy letters, where they would literally just switch out letters uh, to make it look a little bit nicer, then you'd have the wrong spelling. So there's no, uh, no one way to spell this one. You could spell it properly with the J, you could spell it properly with the I. I've kind of stuck with the I just because I think it's kind of an interesting story to be able to tell about the difference between J and I. And we pronounce it Budlia. We don't pronounce it with the J sound, like an English J sound, Budle, Budleja. But uh, really, it, it, uh, as long as everyone knows what you're talking about, you are going to be fine. So there we have the very beautiful and uh, attractive garden ornamental plant, as well as wildlife pollinator attractor, the Budlia davidii butterfly bush. And next up, we have Carissa macrocarpa, the natal plum. This is another edible fruit, as well as a common landscape plant in San Diego. This comes from uh, Africa, the continent of Africa, and it has a broad range all the way from Kenya down to South Africa. Primarily, we see this on the coast. So this one is really tolerant of uh, humidity from the ocean, the maritime influence, the salt spray even, and grows just fine on the coast. It is an evergreen shrub. It could potentially turn into a small tree if you let it, but most people keep them as uh, relatively low growing shrubs. It's very tolerant of hedging. So this is one of the few plants I would recommend to actually do hedge work where you actually use like a hedge trimmer to keep it small. Uh, most plants don't look best when they are hedged, but this one does just fine because it's so compact and thick. Evergreen leaf. The leaf has a bit of a thorny tip on the apex, but what's even more protecting is the thorns themselves. So this plant has some pretty vicious thorns on the branches, usually not too visible from the outside, but if you tried to walk through this plant, you would have uh, quite a bad day. For that reason, it's good in public uh, landscapes and it's good around houses as a security planting. People won't really be inclined to uh, trample all over it or walk through it. You could plant it underneath the bedroom window of your teenager so they don't sneak out at night. And it's going to have a bunch of other benefits too. The flowers, which will bloom throughout most of the year, are very fragrant. They have a smell that's reminiscent of jasmine. And those flowers, once pollinated, give way to a fruit, which is 
kind of like a plum in its flavor, although this is not related to plum. And uh, it's edible. And is it the best tasting fruit? Well, if they're perfectly ripe and they've been kind of pruned in order to grow really well, uh, you can create a desirable fruit. Most of the time it's a bit sour. The flesh is typically a little underwatered, so there's not as much uh, juice in these fruits that can be a little bit astringent. There's also a uh, white latexy type of a sap that if the fruit is not quite ripe, will potentially get into the flavor of the fruit and can really kind of dehydrate your mouth. So in the right circumstance, these are a excellent tasting fruit. Typically, they'd be better for preserved uh, products, jams, jellies, things like that, as opposed to a fresh table fruit. But they are edible and they are a good addition to a landscape. They're quite common. You'll see them in many different applications. There are a few named varieties. In particular, there's uh, one that's really common that is a ground cover. It's, it grows in a prostrate fashion, so it stays low growing. And for all those reasons, this is just an excellent addition to a San Diego landscape. It's a good one to be able to recognize. And like some of our others, this is part of the classical kind of San Diego plant palette. Nowadays, a lot of people would look at this and maybe say, oh, that's so common, it's boring. But uh, my reminder is that the plants themselves are not boring. Uh, if anything, it's how it was designed, installed, and maintained that could be a little bit boring or not look as pleasing or not provide as many benefits. So uh, there's nothing wrong with this plant. It's a great plant to have. It's a valuable one in and of itself. And I challenge you to come up with good scenarios in which to find clever uses of the natal plum. I like to think about uh, how plants with thorns provide valuable security uh, in places where we may want to discourage people from walking. So there we go. There is Carissa macrocarpa natal plum. And next up, we have uh, a ground cover or sort of a succulent. This is called Cystanthi grandiflora, and common name, rock purslane. This plant comes from Chile, from the Mediterranean climate of South America. And this plant has uh, a relatively new scientific name. A lot of people refer to it as its old scientific name, Calendrinia. It's no longer classified under Calendrinia. It is now Cystanthi but uh, some people still call it by the traditional or the old synonym. This is a succulent species, uh, pretty much a ground cover throughout most of the year. And then in spring, it will send up these uh, quite beautiful flowers that are on the solitary flower stalks. Uh, once the flowers, the flowers have a, a decent persistence, they will stick around for several months. And then once the flowers have uh, been pollinated and are spent, it's usually best to come along and deadhead this plant. So that way uh, it just returns to that succulent ground cover that you can see in the image on the left-hand side, that uh, silvery green foliage that otherwise doesn't really seem to uh, attract your attention very much. But these flowers, when they do bloom, they're very vibrant. They almost look like they're lit up they're quite stunning. This is a love it or hate it type of a plant. A lot of uh, residential gardeners like it because it's so easy to grow as a succulent and it fills in gaps. It will spread on its own. And so if you have one, you can divide it over time and you can replant it in other places. It's very hardy. Other people say it's kind of ugly. They don't, they don't like all that mess on top. And uh, I don't really think any plant is ugly. I think you know, I think it's got its own uh, aesthetic value and in the right place, it is a great, nice little addition. It is certainly climate appropriate and uh, the colors it brings are hard to find, almost like a, a poppy or a mallow type flower, although this is in uh, an entirely different family. So here we have rock purslane, Cystanthi grandiflora. And now we have 
cystus purpureus, the orchid rock rose, and cystanthi, our previous genus, was named such because the flowers resemble cystus. So here we have the cystus, which is a Mediterranean plant uh, that produces quite uh, ornamental, stunning flowers. Again, similar to a poppy or a mallow, although this is in a, a separate family as well. And it's hard to come up with a true uh, wild specimen because this plant has been in cultivation for so long that uh, most of the ones we have in the nurseries and around are some type of hybrid, which is where I have selected for us to learn Cystus purpureus, uh, the orchid rock rose, as uh, a hybrid. And uh, it's one that's been planted for a very, very long time. Uh, so coming from a Mediterranean climate, this one's right at home in San Diego. You will see it sometimes out in the wild if it has escaped cultivation. There's a few places on the sides of the freeways that I see this, in particular in the East County, on the side of the Highway 8 freeway, you can see this when it's in bloom. It uh, has a very long bloom time. It grows just fine on the coast all the way into our inland microclimates. If you're in a, a wildland urban interface, you may want to uh, avoid this plant because there could potentially be some escaping from cultivation. But in most places, it's gonna grow just fine for you. And it provides such a terrific and beautiful flower. There are many different patterns and colors that can happen with these flowers, white petals, uh, pink petals, deep purple petals, but they all seem to have the same general characteristic, that kind of papery, poppy-like flower, and uh, the yellow center, and then the five uh, dark spots on the petals that kind of act as a target, a bullseye target for the pollinators when they arrive. So this plant will produce prolific blooms, very tolerant of pruning. It's a relatively low growing shrub. So as far as shrubs go, this one's gonna be uh, three to four feet maximum. So kind of on the smaller side of things and very tidy, easy to keep compact, good right next to sidewalks. You can find it in uh, commercial landscapes as well. So in medians, parking lots, underneath trees, sidewalks, next to restaurants, it works just fine. Uh, pretty hardy, and there are a lot of different named cultivars, different varieties that uh, you can have fun exploring. So here we have Cystus purpureus, the orchid rock rose. And next up we have Echium candicans, the pride of Madeira. This comes from Madeira, which is an island, and uh, island off of Africa, North Africa, in the Atlantic Ocean. It has the Mediterranean climate. This island, as well as several others relatively close by, are part of the islands that were colonized by Spain early on, uh, on the way to colonizing North America. And uh, so this plant has a very interesting growth habit. It's uh, quite distinct, easy to recognize with these large purple or blue flower spikes and kind of a classical Mediterranean garden plant. So all throughout the Mediterranean climates, we'll see this plant. It can escape cultivation. And so in California, we're starting to discourage planting Echium. Although just like many other plants, San Diego is a little bit of an exception because we are so dry that uh, it's a little more rare to see this one escaping cultivation. If you go up to Northern California, you should have a little bit more caution. But in an urban garden, in a landscape, this provides a stunning backdrop. It is a bit on the tall side, six to eight feet or so. These large flower stalks will uh, persist for about half the year. And then you come along and you cut them back to the leaf height. And so you can deadhead this plant and it helps to keep it compact and tidy. If you don't 
maintain the plant in that way, it will tend to branch out and get a little bit leggy and over time look a little more scraggly. This is good as a backdrop. So uh, up against a wall or kind of the background of a landscape because it sends up those tall flowers and then otherwise kind of blends in. And so it's uh, really nice to observe from a distance. Although if you have a chance to get close to it, it's really fun to watch the pollinators arrive to this plant. Uh, there's some in particular that like it more than others, although it attracts almost everybody, including honeybees. Uh, this one will attract the sphinx moth, which a lot of people also call the hummingbird moth. It's a moth that you can find in daytime and more common in the afternoons, and it will look like a hummingbird. It's a, a relatively large moth that beats its wings very fast and can hover and comes up and drinks the nectar from these flowers. So if you've got an echium or two around, you will likely uh, be attracting the sphinx moth. We have several species of sphinx moth native to our area. And uh, just brings about general interest in the landscape and has been a landscape plant for Mediterranean climates for a very long time. The silvery green foliage has uh, relatively large leaves that are uh, arranged in sort of a rosette pattern. You can get uh, varieties that are variegated, so they have kind of a lighter and darker stripe along these plants. But ultimately, it's just a great addition to a Mediterranean garden and one that's worthy of uh, recognizing. It's important to know how to properly maintain it. And it's a good addition to uh, more of a classical landscape. Say you had uh, colonial style architecture or some of the old properties in San Diego that have established landscapes. Echium is a plant that looks right at home uh, in places like this because of the long-lived uh, European history of introducing this plant to Mediterranean climates throughout the world. So here we have Echium candicans, pride of Madeira. And next up we have Areobatria japonica, the loquat. Just like our pineapple guava, this is another uh, climate appropriate fruit tree. It's a fruit tree that you don't typically find in stores because of the short shelf life. This one comes from South Central China uh, in the subtropical regions, but it is drought tolerant. And so like our pineapple guava, this is a low water use tree, a low growing tree, which again would be good under power lines. It's a standard in the Southern California landscape part of the kind of 1950s suburbia, this tree was grown uh, far and wide, very common in LA and San Diego. You can grow the fruit commercially. And when you do so, you want to thin the fruit because uh, you can see the flowers on the left-hand photo giving way to the yellow fruit on the right-hand side. You'll get a much larger fruit that has a better taste if you thin the fruit. And the, the tool of choice is the yellow plastic wiffle bat, a little baseball bat that you used to play with. You get it from, you know, the grocery store or something like that. Come along and you give the fruit a little whack and you can remove 50% of the fruit relatively easily. The leaves have a tropical look. They're a bit glossy in their appearance, although they are covered in some small hairs. And that may be part of what gives this a bit of a drought tolerance, the leathery and the pubescent leaves, which can limit water loss. The leaves themselves are considered medicinal and, and are generally processed into a tea that uh, you can drink for all sorts of different potential ailments. So you have medicinal leaves, edible fruit, and an ornamental attractive appearance of this uh, tree. This is an evergreen tree. It will not lose its leaves. And it provides year-round interest because of its uh, large foliage 
It's attractive flowers and is delicious fruit. So here we have Areobatria japonica, loquat. And next up we have Mesambrianthemum cordifolium, red apple, ice plant. Another kind of classic Southern California landscape plant. This is a ground cover, it's a succulent. And it's one of the many plants that we call ice plant. There's several different plants all given the common name ice plant. This is one of them. This is red apple because of its red flowers. And in particular, this has an ornamental leaf shape, uh, a bit of a heart-shaped leaf, which is where we get the name cordifolium, heart-shaped leaf. And this is a nice, compact, small-leaved ground cover. This is not one of the invasive ice plants. This will not cause problems in the landscape. It's relatively tidy and it's a very drought tolerant ground cover. It's a good one to recognize. It needs a bit of uh, irrigation. So in the total wild lands, if it was left alone completely, it'll probably start to look a little bit scraggly, but if you give it just a little bit of irrigation, it'll stay very compact, very dense. Bees like to visit this and it uh, shades the ground completely. Ice plants are a bit on the controversial side. Some people think they're very problematic and certainly some species are worse than others. But any plant that is gonna be a ground cover is gonna have a lot of benefit. It's going to shade the soil, prevent evaporation, and it will build up organic matter as well as it provides some habitat prevents erosion. If any rain or irrigation lands on top, it'll go right in. And I find this type of ice plant to be particularly beneficial if I plant a new fruit tree. If I plant a fruit tree, uh, depending on the circumstances, I may consider putting some ice plant around the base because it doesn't take much water away from the tree and it shades the soil and prevents weeds from popping up and it provides a, a valuable a uh, ring of life around my young fruit tree that enables water to enter the soil more easily and prevents evaporation. So I find a nice little uh, relationship between the ice plant and the fruit tree. And in a backyard, residential orchard, uh, putting this one at the bottom is a good call. You'll also see in older established commercial landscapes, this plant, red apple ice plant, was used in and around tree plots. And then eventually the trees grow up and as they drop leaf litter or pine needles or whatever they are, they will cover up this plant and it'll start to disappear. I think that's a great application and it's using nature uh, to favor your landscape. The key there is to let this plant disappear in those circumstances. Don't go and rake up all the leaf litter because you need to keep the red apple ice plant alive the red apple ice plant was doing a job, getting the trees to get established and then let it disappear, let it go away. I see some landscapes that are maintained in ways where they'll go in and they'll cut any trees that sprout underneath this ice plant because they wanna maintain the carpet of ice plant. And that really uh, is something that probably shouldn't be done. Let the ice plant be a temporary installation that uh, lasts for maybe 10 years or so. And once the trees and shrubs grow up, they can shade it out. They can provide leaf litter on top. And then you just end up having this decompose into a nice rich soil. So there are some functional benefits as well as an aesthetic value. It's obviously fire wise. As a succulent species, this one is not tolerant to frost. So you'll need to plant it on the coast or in areas where you don't get any freezing temperatures. But it's a great one to have in the arsenal. The scientific name is unfortunate. Anything that's more than five syllables is going to be hard to remember. And there's an older name that's much easier. I won't bother you with that name, but uh, this is the one we've got now. And so it's up to us to remember it. This is Mesembrianthemum cordifolium, red apple ice plant. And we'll finish it off here with a couple of sage species. The first one we'll talk about today is Salvia lucantha, the Mexican sage. 
Salvia leucantha is a very common landscape plant in California. It, of all the sages, this one requires a bit more water than the others. Coming from uh, Central America and Mexico, it's used to a bit more of a tropical, subtropical climate where it gets rain in the summertime. So it can grow just fine here, but it, you're going to need to give it a little bit of extra irrigation. Obviously, it's planted for its beautiful ornamental flowers. And the key thing to observe is leucantha. That means white anther, or the male part of the flower is white. So notice this flower has two-tone colors. It's purple and then white. And when you see this, that's what gives it away as salvia leucantha. Notice the characteristic leaf arrangement. We have alternating opposite leaves on a square stem, which is characteristic of all sages. And this one in particular has a large leaf that is pointed with a deep texture to it and a sort of a minty green color. As far as fragrance goes, this sage is not one of the most fragrant, but it is very ornamental. It's very attractive and uh, primarily attracts hummingbirds, but it attracts all sorts of pollinators as well, including small birds that will move in and drink the nectar uh, from this plant. And sometimes you'll even see them hanging upside down as they reach in to get the nectar from the flowers. As far as sages go, this one is a bit more herbaceous than some of our others. And I've referenced before pruning strategies for sages. And what I've said is that they don't like to be, it's not good if you prune into the wood. So if the, if the stem or the trunk gets really thick and woody and you cut that, it will be less likely to re-sprout. That's why. And so you're always wanting to trim herbaceous parts, the soft green parts of the sages, because the tree will, the shrub will, uh, repair itself, and regrow much better. But if you cut into the thick wood, you're going to have problems. Well, this is one that is beneficial to keep from getting woody at all. So uh, this sage is more herbaceous. What that means is you can cut it down almost to the ground every year. And when you do so, it will send up new leaves and flowers uh, to a mature height, and you'll have a much more compact growth habit, and it just has an overall more attractive appearance. So of all the sages, this is one of the ones that you treat like an herbaceous plant instead of treating it like a small tree, and you come along and you chop it back very severely, very heavily, and it will respond uh, with vigorous, healthy growth. You treat uh, the Budlias in a similar way, and you'll treat the next plant we'll talk about in a similar way as well. So what you do is you let this grow after the beautiful flower display when the anthers, the white part of the flower, falls away and starts to turn into a pollinated flower that drops seeds. Then it, that's your cue to come, on, come in and uh, cut this back. You can cut it all the way back to the ground for the most part, usually at the end of summer and then it will regrow all through winter and spring and give you another beautiful floral display. So here we have a valuable addition to the California landscape. This is Mexican sage, Salvia leucantha. And last but not least, we have Salvia microphylla, the mountain sage. A lot of people include this in a California native plant garden, although it's not truly native to California. It comes from east, Arizona, Texas, all the way down to Central America. But it grows just fine in San Diego in California. And of all the sages, this one and one similar have very unique flowers for a sage. Very attractive, but on the small side. And microphylla simply refers to little leaves. So one of the common names is mountain sage. People also call it crimson sage or baby sage, several different common names. 
And the photo I've shown shows a cultivar, a very common cultivar that is uh, generally highly prized, and it's called hot lips. So this is Salvia microphylla hot lips. And what you get with hot lips is two-tone flowers. And here we have red and white. And as the flower matures, it goes from white to red, but the effect you end up having is uh, the plant gets covered in just in general, red and white flowers. And that looks very interesting, very unique, kind of like a candy cane. Uh, they're very striking, very vibrant, and uh, a nice plant. This one will attract hummingbirds, great for a pollinator garden. And notice how thin and wispy these stems are, just like our previous sage. This sage also benefits if you treat it like a perennial, so you can cut it back. Instead of cutting this one all the way back to the ground, I recommend you cut it back about one third of its size. And in the photo on the right hand side, you can even see there's kind of a shrub within a shrub. So uh, I can look and I can observe about a third of the way down, it starts to get more compact. And when it does, that's the place where I would come along and once a year I would come along and cut this back right after all the flowers have displayed. That will keep this plant in a tidy habit. It will make it produce more flowers and it will help everything just uh, look its best. It's a relatively easy way to take care of this plant too. Just do it once a year and trim it back to about uh, two thirds of its actual height. So remove one third of the material. And otherwise it's a great plant to mix in. Uh, it will fill in any gaps. So if you have several trees and shrubs planted closely together, you could stick this one in between and it fills in the gaps and brings uh, color and foliage, as well as uh, habitat value. It's a low water use plant. It's perfectly happy in a San Diego garden. And it's a great addition. And if I was going to plant this one, I would pretty much always look for hot lips cultivar, Salvia microphylla hot lips, the mountain sage. So there we go. I hope you enjoyed this next 10 plants of our list. Just kind of some miscellaneous flowering shrubs, good additions to San Diego landscapes. And we're really building up a valid portfolio here of uh, plants that you should be able to know and recognize and then become familiar with enough to be able to recommend to clients and include in design and installation work of your future. I hope you enjoy learning about these and all the others. And this is our second to last plant list we will cover. This is 4A. Next up, we'll have 4B, and that will be the end of our semester. Thanks a lot.